Carly Simon, that is, if you didn't remember. Anticipation. The adage goes, good things come to those who wait. The real question is, though, how long you should have to wait for something good to happen. Think about how hard it is to wait, say, for a child to be born, or your approaching wedding. We can wait a little while for these good things, but by and large, we humans aren't very good at waiting. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we're constantly aware of the relative shortness of our lifespan. We don't want to waste our little block of time. Some studies have shown that if you live to be 70, you will have spent three full years of that life simply waiting for something to happen. Waiting in traffic, waiting in waiting rooms, waiting on hold, waiting at the airport. We spend a lot of time anticipating, and we get more than a little frustrated if we have to wait too long for what we want or need. Part of the problem is that we're governed by the chronos time or the ticking clock. But we often forget that the rest of creation tends to work on a different timetable. We're watching minutes and seconds while the earth is marking time in epics. While we're frantic to get things done, creation is far more patient. Take, for example, the experiment begun in 1927 by Professor Thomas Parnell of the University of Queensland in Australia. Parnell wanted to demonstrate to his students that some substances that appear to be solid are actually liquid. So he heated up some pitch petroleum-based substance known for its stickiness and high viscosity. It's the stuff that Noah used to waterproof the ark. And he sealed it in a funnel-shaped glass tube. After three years, the pitch had coagulated. And so Parnell unsealed the nozzle on that tube to see how long it would take for a now solidified mass of pitch to drain out. The pitch drop experiment was born. The result? Well, let's put it this way. By the time that the first drop formed, two years later, most of Parnell's students had already graduated. And by the time the first drop actually fell, those students had probably completely forgotten Parnell and the experiment altogether. It took eight years for the first drop to finally drop. It took an additional eight years for the second drop to fall. And then Parnell died in 48, which means he only saw two drops. But fear not, the experiment is still going on. As of today, nine drops have fallen and the wait for the tent is in full sweat. And if you'd like to join, there is a webcam set up by the University of Brisbane so the whole world can watch, assuming that you don't have anything to better to do while you're waiting, say, for a paint to dry. <laughs> the experiment is so slow that the Guinness Book of World Records listed as the longest running experiment in history. Scientists estimate that there's enough pitch in that funnel that it's going to take more than a hundred years to drain out, outliving every last one of us here. And the really crazy part, no one has ever actually seen one of the drops fall. They only see the result of the fall. How frustrating is that? <laughs> After the eighth drop, the scientists calculated that the viscosity, the stickiness, for those of us that are liberal art majors, of pitch is roughly 230 billion times more than water. That's a lot of time. Waiting for a drop every eight or nine years isn't exactly the patience that most of us have, I dare say. And the Israelites 
certainly didn't have that. They were looking for a lot less viscosity and a whole lot more water. Even a drop or two would have been exciting to an increasingly thirsty and thoroughly impatient people. As Exodus 17 opens, God has once again commanded the Israelites to move by stages through the desert on their sojourn from escape, slavery, and oppression in Egypt to the Promised Land. And just three chapters earlier, we read that God had miraculously brought them through the Red Sea by increasing the viscosity of water and making it stand up in order to clear a path for people. And then, a chapter later, those same people are sounding more like impatient restaurant patrons than liberated slaves. God, whom the people see as being representative of, uh, in Moses, well, not delivering the food fast enough. They want a squeeze bottle, not a slow drip. They pined for the good old days in Egypt. When, oh yeah, we were slaves, but at least our bellies were full. And God responds by providing manna and quail as a daily provision of food in the middle of nowhere. But even that eventually gets bored. And the impatient complaints get louder. In Exodus 17, the issue again is lack of water. The demand is incessant. Give us water to drink. In the midst of a crisis, it's hard for humans to take the long view and understand God's long, steady purpose. Instead, we, we focus on the shortness of life. The people are angry that Moses brought them out there to kill them and their livestock with thirst. And while Moses is concerned about his own hide, because as he once said, these people are ready to stone me, God. When we're in trouble, we can hear that clipping, clipping, clipping of the time ticking down with increasing urgency. But God, God isn't bound by that kind of compressed view of time. Throughout the scriptures, God's timing, rather than clock time, is what really matters. If chronos is our time, governed by the clock, God's time is kairos, time governed by God. The right time, the appropriate time, the divinely appointed time. Now, God created the universe billions of years ago, as science tells us, and then the earth has been shaped over billions of years by the steady drip of water and the slow shifting of tectonic plates. The one thing we come to realize theologically is that God isn't in a hurry. God has a long worldview, far longer than our temporal bodies and limited knowledge can understand. God has patiently formed creation. And God will continue to patiently form God's people. Doing things always at the right time. The Kairos time. The time that suits God's eternal purposes. See, God doesn't respond to the people's complaints or Moses' fear with chastisement. God simply says to Moses, go. When we're stuck waiting, even a little progress is good, right? Moses is instructed to go to the rock at Horeb, another term for Mount Sinai, and meet God, who will already be standing there. Wherever we're going, whatever we're waiting for, at the end of the line, God is already there. The patient God then does something for his impatient people. He instructs Moses to strike the rock. And he's to do it with the same staff he used to 
strike the Nile when demonstrating God's power to Pharaoh. And at that point, God confirms Professor Parnell's thesis that often what appears to be a solid can actually be a liquid. The writer of Exodus doesn't tell us how the water came out, only that it did so. And I bet it's more of a gusher than a few little drops. But God had to repeat this kind of lesson with the Israelites over and over and over again. Just like Jesus had to constantly remind his disciples to stop worrying about today and instead seek God first and God's kingdom. I don't think we're any better when it comes to waiting as the patient of the psalmist put it. Be still, be still, and know that I am God. But as we seek the harvest of patience, as we try to develop that gift of the Spirit in our own lives, as we seek first God, it's amazing how everything else kind of begins to make sense. You might call it living with an eternal perspective, recognizing that wherever we're headed with our lives, God is with us, and indeed, God is already ahead of us, waiting there. In a culture like ours, where Amazon Prime feeds our quest for instant gratification and advertising all over the place screams that we not only need something now, but we deserve it now. We need more and more than ever to work on cultivating the harvest of patience in our lives. To be still and know that God is. To wait on the Lord. It's hard. But we won't be stopped. Anticipation. It's worth the wait. Amen.